In this video, we're going to talk about deep vein thrombosis, or DVT for short, which is a big issue, especially amongst patients post-op, undergoing surgery, patients who are immobile, chronic illness, and bed-bound. DVT can lead to a common complication called pulmonary embolism, which is life-threatening. The signs and symptoms of DVT include asymmetrical edema, asymmetrical calf swelling, and asymmetrical localized pain in the calf. There can be signs and symptoms of pulmonary embolism as well, which is again a common complication of DVT. Drawing a normal leg, on the left here we have a leg with DVT. The leg with DVT on the left is swollen, has edema with erythema, and is warm. So deep vein thrombosis, as the name implies, it means thrombus forming within the deep veins. So let's look at a normal vein of the legs here. A normal vein of the legs have valves which assist in the hemodynamics of the veins and helps return blood back to the heart by preventing backflow. In deep vein thrombosis there is thrombus occurring within these veins of the leg, the lower legs usually, and so clotting is occurring. A thrombus is made up of a network of fibrin mesh, platelets, and red blood cells. They all clump together via coagulation cascade and forms what's known as a thrombus. There are many causes of deep vein thrombosis or thrombus formation. But it can all be condensed to three things. And these three things are, or factors make up what we call Virchow's triad. And Virchow's triad is a uh, includes vessel injury, number one, venous stasis, number two, and hypercoagulability, number three. Different diseases, condition, leads to one or more of these factors, and this, and this will predispose one to developing deep vein thrombosis. And so once a thrombus has occurred, the thrombus itself has a few fates, including propagation, which means just growing along the vessel, Organization, organizing within the vessel layer. Recanulization, forming holes within the thrombus. Embolism, which means dislodgement of the thrombus, allowing the thrombus to travel around the body via the blood. A and or resolution, the thrombus just uh, gets broken down by plasmin, by factors that we have in our own body. But we will mainly focus on embolism because it is a common fate of thrombus in the deep veins and can be life-threatening. When a thrombus dislodges and becomes an embolus, it can travel up to the heart via the inferior vena cava. The heart will then pump the embolus to the pulmonary circulation. The embolus can then lodge into the pulmonary arteries causing a what's known sorry, as a pulmonary embolism, and this can subsequently cause pulmonary tissue infarct if it is big. And so pulmonary embolism is a big complication of deep vein thrombosis. Another big complication is actually the side effects of, of the medications people take who have deep vein thrombosis. And these medications, they can cause acute GI bleeding because the medications are anticoagulants. The risk factors for developing deep vein thrombosis essentially will fall into one or more of the virtues. Uh, category, the Virchow's triad category, and these risk factors include pregnancy. Now pregnancy can cause or is a risk factor to DVT because when the uterus enlarges it can press against the inferior vena cava causing stasis below. Also in pregnancy there is a rise in clotting factors. Other risk factors for developing deep vein thrombosis include increased age, obesity, malignancy, having had a major surgery for the past three months, having medical comorbidities, being hospitalized in the past two weeks. And for patients who are hospitalized, 25 to 50% of actually surgical patients can develop DVT and also many non-surgical patients. Other risk factors for DVT include being on certain medications such as oral contraceptives, tamoxifen, being on long distance flights. Genetics also plays a role in increasing the risk of DVT. 
genetics including antithrombin G mutation, protein C and S deficiency, and also antithrombin deficiency. Investigations for deep vein thrombosis include a full blood count, liver function test, electrolyte urea creatinine, INR, APTT, which are both clotting studies, imaging, including venous duplex ultrasound, and imaging can also include imaging for the chest in suspicion of pulmonary embolism. There is another investigation that can be done based on the coagulation cascade. Let us briefly go through the coagulation cascade. There are two pathways in the clotting cascade or coagulation cascade, which is the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway. Both the extrinsic pathway and the in intrinsic pathway will lead to a common pathway, which is activation of factor 10 to factor 10A. 10A in turn activates factor 2, or prothrombin, to factor 2A, which is known as thrombin. Thrombin then activates fibrinogen to fibrin. Fibrin forms the basis of the fibrin mesh and is the last step in the formation of the thrombus. So now the thrombus is formed. However, things can also break down the thrombus. These things is plasminogen or plasmin, and a plasmin cleaves the fibrin, creating what is now called a D-dimer. During active thrombosis, there is elevated D-dimers. And so the measurement of a D-dimer can give some indication of coagulation activity that is occurring in the body. However, saying this, testing for D-dimers is not very specific for deep vein thrombosis, as elevated D-dimers also occur in a number of other conditions, including pregnancy, as well as post-surgery. And so measuring D-dimers is often not useful, but sometimes it is useful in ruling out pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis. Let's move on to management, which is mainly anticoagulants. And essentially, the anticoagulants include heparin, and there are two types of heparin that can be given. Low molecular weight heparin, which is given IV, or subcutaneous unfractured heparin. Warfarin is given orally and needs maintenance through INR measurement. Essentially, heparin and warfarin target some pathways within the clotting cascade, mainly the common pathway. Another important management is actually prophylaxis, preventing PE from occurring. And this is especially important for patients who are undergoing surgery. And these Prophylaxis interventions include compression stockings, as well as physical act activity for the people that sit down a lot to keep the blood flowing.